The son of a line of gardeners of the king, André Le Nôtre was born in Paris on March 12, 1613. In 1637, King Louis XIII guaranteed Le Nôtre that he would continue in the office of his father, and he became the first gardener of King Louis XIV from 1645 to 1700, thus lasting more than 50 years. André Le Nôtre was the first gardener to be ennobled by a king. Gardener, yes, but for pruning differences in height, shaping majestic walkways, placing pools of water in the axes of major lines, or creating fountains amongst bosquets. Le Nôtre was land art before land art. He imposes angles of view while at the same time letting one wander at liberty. Everything seems straight, orthogonal, and level, and yet nothing really is. Le Nôtre was the creator of many French formal gardens, in France and abroad. His notable tasks included conceiving and laying out the parks and gardens at Château de Chantilly, Saint-Germain-en-Laye, and of course Versailles. But his first masterpiece would be made for Nicolas Fouquet, the finance minister of King Louis XIV, who was very much in favor at the time. In 1656, Le Nôtre designed the new gardens of his Château vaux le vicomte His plans were built around a brilliantly mastered main axis, in composing the layout of the chateau over a space of 40 hectares cut from the heart of nature, André Le Nôtre accomplished a perfect harmony between architecture and landscape. The power of the synthesis of his design, its theatrical majesty, and the abundance of water and surprises make the garden at Vaux the founding work of the art of the French formal garden. Here, André Le Nôtre worked in close coordination with Louis Le Vaux and Charles Lebrun, the architect and the decorator of the chateau, creating parterres, sketches of water, bosquets, and employing forced perspective. At Vaux, Fouquet offered a blank canvas to the architect Le Vaux and the landscape artist Le Nôtre, and both worked together to create a harmonious ensemble. To demonstrate the work shared between architect and gardener, I can cite two techniques that, used together, contributed to the making of this famous harmony. <laughs> the first technique is architectural and called transparency, which requires an unobstructed view, with no walls to create any obstacle. By applying this technique in the 17th century, no doors, no gates, no windows appeared on any of the three arches of the chateau. The three arches passed through the chateau from one end to the other, rendering it virtually transparent. We can see this transparency when we arrive from the northern end of the chateau. We discover in one glance the building, and through it, the garden. The entirety is so well made that from the other side it is difficult to say where the chateau ends and where the gardens begin. In the gardens, they use the second technique, that of decelerated perspective. This technique consists of enlarging all of the elements of the garden as they distance themselves from the chateau, parterres, statues, basins, topiaries. This modifies the visual perception of the natural perspective, making it possible to encompass a large garden which surrounds the chateau within the harmonious ensemble. The foreshortened or accelerated perspectives, rock gardens, bosquet, ponds, and parterre of box trees were already utilized in Italian gardens, but André Le Nôtre carried the design and composition of these earlier gardens to perfection. He introduced methods borrowed from mathematics and optics that he would adjust to suit the sites he encountered. Reduced to the simplest traits, his body of work serves as an absolute point of reference, imitated across all of Europe. It's important to keep in mind that when Le Nôtre arrived in 1656, there had been a river passing diagonally at the south of the chateau. The first job of André Le Nôtre was to divert this river and to canalize it so that it would pass underground to the east of the gardens. From there, he had to transform what had been the riverbed into flat land on which to build his gardens. He would display his innovative genius, for at the time, the common practice, inherited from the Middle Ages, was to create four parterres of equal size to go around the main basin. 
At Vaux, Le Nôtre would use very long rectangular parterres and a main path that would create the access of perspective. What we see here embodies French-style gardens. If, from where we are now, we look at the round basin at the middle of the gardens and the square basin in the background, we have the impression that they're the same size. In fact, the square basin is eight times larger than the round one, because the round basin measures 410 square meters. This is a typical characteristic of André Le Nôtre's gardens, where appearance always reigns over reality. Let us come back to what is before us, meaning Vaux's gardens and the French style, which are not limited to what we see here. It's not merely a question of geometrical and symmetrical parterres, it is much more complex and above all represents the way the world was perceived at that time. For example, the first principle of the French style garden is to show that man dominates over nature and can manipulate it as he wishes. To achieve this, plants are constantly and rigorously trimmed and colorful minerals are used in the parterre. Thus, a somewhat identical decor was maintained throughout the year, with little attention needing to be paid to the changing seasons. The second major principle is the marriage between the gardens and the building. The chateau should no longer have gardens placed around it, but rather the chateau and garden should be married harmoniously. To achieve this, Le Nôtre would use the elements of the garden, parterre, statues, basins, in such a way that they would blend with the home, as if they were extra rooms. I'm going to explain why this type of garden is known as the French-style garden. Quite simply, it is because these gardens were developed by the French landscape artists of the 16th and 17th centuries. The most famous of these gardeners, and he who brought gardening to the level of an art, was of course André Le Nôtre. I use the word developed rather than invented because the history of gardens is a series of evolutions in which each page is written based on the page before it. The French-style gardens do not break from this rule as they were inheritors of the Italian gardens of the 15th and 16th centuries, which were themselves inspired by the gardens of antiquity, where the alignments of vegetation, statues, topiaries and basins already existed. Visitors have preconceived ideas and say to themselves that French-style gardens are rather sad, a bit classic. It is certainly beautiful, balanced, but this is where Le Nôtre is a true genius, for in his gardens we progressively find the surprises he wished to create. As another chateau at Chantilly or even Versailles, the majority of visitors, as many as 80%, stop at the chateau's terrace and say, I've seen it, I've got it. But in fact, you have to walk to understand. After 100 meters, surprises already begin to appear. After 200 meters, still others are found. There are surprises in one direction, surprises in the other. That is what's interesting. When you make an effort to go to the end of the garden, you discover the canal, which is not visible from the chateau. It is there that you realize that you should take the time to go around the canal, to get to the statue of Hercules. There you have a superb view of the gardens and the chateau. Here you sense and understand the perfect success of the three geniuses. It is about perfect balance between the garden and the chateau, even including the commons, which serve as wings to the chateau. If Fouquet had not asked for them from Levaux, or if Levaux had not imagined the commons on the sides of the chateau, the chateau would almost be too alone in the middle of the garden. It's truly a perfect success.
To defy the limitations of the horizon, Le Nôtre used a genius that only he possessed, working with projection, geometric figures, and the succession of views. It gave the sights a new scope, a wonderful harmonious dynamic in the relationships between shadow and light, sparse and dense, grandiose and intimate, near and far. The monumental seven-meter-high statue of gilded lead that occupies the final point of view of the very long gravel walk acts as an allusion to the very powerful minister himself. We're now at the foot of Hercules' statue. Hercules is shown performing his eleventh labor. What is interesting here is the perspective we have on the gardens. We realize that we have a very different view from all the others we have seen until now. When we are here, we have the impression that there are two commons, east and west. The two bodies of the lateral building seem to be situated on the same level as the chateau, when in fact they are much further back. We see here again that some elements are hidden, while others are revealed. For example, the large round basin, the basin of the sheaf, is not clearly visible when we are only 50 meters away. The boxwood broderies, or hedges that seem embroidered, seen here, make a long line of green whose design is voluntarily difficult to distinguish. The little canals are masked. We do not see the water trellises either. We once again see that the French-style gardens, which have the reputation of being simple and identical, are in fact ever-changing and complex. This is principally due to the expertise of André Le Nôtre. We are now in the flower beds, created specifically at the request of Nicolas Fouquet, for Le Nôtre was no great fan of flowers. He thought that flowers require too much time, are too ephemeral, and above all, would disturb the philosophy of the French-style gardens created to show man dominating nature. Nonetheless, Fouquet, who adored flowers, asked him specifically to make a flower garden close to the chateau, so that he could see them from the chateau's windows. That is what you see here. The massive floral arrangements had, of course, disappeared over time and were only recreated in 2001. The gardens that extend out around the chateau are made up of terraces and parterres, and nothing interrupts the dominant horizontal. In Fouquet's time, the closest parterres to the chateau were considered the most noble ornament of a garden, being the most visible from the living quarters. To the left of the flower bed, which is located off-center, there lies the Grand Pater de Broderie. At Vaux we have bowling greens, boxwood embroideries, which are also known as turquerie, because in the 17th century their patterns were inspired by the original motifs of Turkish rugs that were very fashionable at the time. The current state of the embroidered parterre is a reconstitution. The borders have been thinner and the yellow sand contrasted with the carbon gravel. Today, the red of the embroideries is achieved by piling bricks. Behind me are the parterre of the crown, with, at its most eastern side, a crown situated here in honor of the king. Indeed, the windows of the king's bedroom, in which he never slept, were created for him, and looked out on the parterre. The crown in the middle of the fountain was meant to pay homage to Louis XIV. André Le Nôtre invented landscapes that transformed as one went along the promenade. This constant rebirth seemed so fluid that it overshadowed its mathematical conception. That's why a solid training is necessary. In this respect, the planning of a garden and its upkeep call for a large number of techniques such as leveling, hydraulics, silviculture, 
horticulture, and of course optics and geometry. All this in the service of the greater harmony. When Louis XIV saw this masterpiece, he simply had to hire the three talents and say, now I will give you even more means, and you can make me something even bigger. And that is how Versailles was born. After the arrest of Fouquet in 1661, André Le Nôtre moved into the service of Louis XIV and began working on the site for the gardens of the Château de Versailles. He drew up the plans and supervised their execution. But if the Garden of Versailles is known as the universal model of a French formal garden, and therefore the art of André le Nôtre, it remains no less a collective effort. During the 17th century, the company Le Nôtre functioned like one of today's large architectural agencies. A squad of specialized collaborators covered Europe, evaluated the needs of clients, and put together dossiers which he worked on from his studio. It was impossible for him to be physically present at the hundreds of sites in progress. Far from being the gesture completed by a sole artist free from all constraint, the gardens of André Le Nôtre are the pragmatic result of a group of numerous collaborators working together. Le Nôtre, the landscape architect of Louis XIV, is the mastermind associated with this type of garden layout, and he developed the idea of the French formal garden. Le Nôtre did not, however, invent this idea, since the French formal garden had come into being around 50 years previously. But Le Nôtre did bring the formal garden to Versailles and develop it on a larger scale than ever before. The gardens are set out along an east-west axis, which is 12 kilometers long. It starts among the hills of Meudon and reaches across to Villepreux on the other side. This axis Access stretches from one horizon to the other and provided a starting point for the town of Versailles, which was laid out towards the east, around three main avenues originally marked out by Le Nôtre. The chateau provides a barrier between the town and the garden on the other side of it. The central elements of the garden were the parterre d'eau, the bassin de la tome, the green lawn known as the green carpet, and the Grand Canal. Le Nôtre laid out these elements as the backbone for his project and divided all the space to the west into a grid using a network of parallel walkways, or walkways radiating out from it. These structured the space geometrically. It has often been said that Le Nôtre's great achievement was to impose geometry on geographical elements. That's exactly the exercise he carried out here. This is a natural hilly site, and Le Nôtre came and imposed his orthogonal grid over it. He laid his geometrical grid over this small valley of the Paris region, which was quite nondescript to start out with. Laying out a French formal garden always starts with excavation work. When starting out with a hilly sloped site, the role of a landscape architect is to successfully divide the site into horizontal terraces by taking earth from one place and moving it to another. The earth dug out from the upper part of the garden is used to create embankments for the lower part. The end result is a site divided into different tiers. Within each tier, a flower bed is added, as well as fountains, and since the chateau itself itself was built on a hillock, the system of tiered terraces can be seen on all three sides, to the west, but also to the north and the south. And in each direction, Le Nôtre did things differently, always with some kind of effect where you would walk forward like this with a space down below you can't see, and it was only in moving closer to this space and leaning over the balcony that you could see how things down below were laid out. Here we're on the south side. This side got the most exposure to the sun, so this is where the orangery was set up.
Orange trees came into being as early as the Renaissance period in France, since King Francis I bought orange trees in Spain and Italy and planted them at Fontainebleau. Later, Louis XIV moved some of these orange trees from Fontainebleau to the orangery in Versailles. To store this collection, which consisted of 1,000 orange trees at the time, all in crates, the first orangery was built by the famous architect Levaux, and it was about a quarter of the size of today's orangery. Then, since the collection was growing and the gardens were gradually spreading too, the orangery built by Levaux was demolished and the great orangery you can see today was built by Mansart, another architect. It's a building with very thick walls, which was not heated. This meant that in the summer all the windows were open to allow the heat to come in and seep into the walls. Then the walls, because they were thick enough to store energy, absorbed the summer heat and released it to the trees again in winter. The large framed windows you can see here were originally quadruple glazed to help insulate against the cold and avoid frost damaging the harvest. At Versailles, Le Notre refined his conception of the material aspects of a garden, the principal routes interrupted by secondary pathways bordering on bousquets, the decor and unusual waterworks contrasted with a rigorous symmetry of wooded masses, and the trellises and arbors forming vast walls of vegetation that underline the perspectives. The principal pathways are lined by statues, and the obliques lead to groves in order to keep the surprise in store. You've already seen how, in the wide vistas of the gardens, there are walls made of plants around the bosquet. And each of the 15 bosquets at Versailles has its own character, its own style, and its own architecture. They tie together the fountains, the statues, the design of the trellis fences, sometimes also marble structures. And each of the 15 bosquets really has a different atmosphere and layout. Here's the Three Fountains Grove, which was very important in the creation of Versailles. It's one of Le Notre's most attractive bosquets. He designed it entirely in 1675, and it was originally divided between three separate terraces. Each of the three terraces had a fountain and an ornamental pond. On the upper level is a round pond, in the middle a square one, and on the lower level an octagonal one. We are currently on the upper terrace, which has the round pond, the smallest of the three, but it's also the one which has the largest hydraulic mechanism, featuring two circuits, one around the edge of the pond and one in the center, with a total of 140 water jets. The central column is higher than the one around the edges. The water jet mechanism is hidden among these big walls of pebbles. The same decorative pebbles can be seen here, but used on a smaller scale. We know from the construction bills that the pebbles used to decorate this bosquet came from a quarry close to montfort la -Maurie. That's how the town was listed in the 17th century. The materials used are rustic in some places, for example, all the slivers of millstone rock, which are just opposite, alongside a few pieces of flint, which came from the Paris region, and which were placed next to these bands of marble from Languedoc, which came from the quarry of cône minervois in the Aude region. This entire waterfall was organized around one central element, this huge shell. You can see here that tropical shells from the Indian Ocean were used to put on the finishing touches to the decoration of the fountain. A few of them were taken and used to renovate the Three Fountains Grove. Now we're on the middle terrace with the square pond, which is supplied by these two pipes you can see here. The water jets are at a slight angle. By that I mean that at the corners of the pond, the water jets shoot straight up, but the three horizontal ones in the middle are at an angle, allowing them to make a cradle of water, like a sort of arch. This lets people see through them. When you're in the middle, you can see the central fountain through the arch of water. And now finally, we're on the lower terrace 
house with its octagonal pond, which has in the middle what we call a tiered cascade. That's to say a system with water jets on different levels. The water comes out of a central jet and splashes off the tiers. Each of the tiers is decorated with the same kind of pebbles, slivers of millstone and tropical shells. The pink ones are conch shells and the red ones are red helmet shells. These elements are allusions to the ocean. For his private life, the king had the Grand Trianon constructed further away in the park in order to keep the fiery crowd of the court at arm's length. In the gardens, the mastery of nature is total in its deepening shades of green. You can see behind me the northern limb of the Grand Canal. Generally, when the king came to stay in the Grand Trianon Palace, he came from Versailles by boat. He went up the ramp leading out of the Bassin du Fer à Cheval and could go through the gardens either directly into his bedchamber, which was where he spent most of his time, or into his council chamber, that is to say, the Room of Mirrors. From the garden, you can also see the parterre d'eau in its entirety. This is generally where tents were pitched during fine weather, so that the king could dine out in the evening with ladies from the court he had invited to the Trianon. For the last 400 years, gardeners have been planting the flower beds in the traditional way. We are now embellishing these flower beds with flowers which correspond to those used at the time. We are planting cleome, china asters, and all kinds of plants, other plants similar to asters. Our aim is to produce flower beds which look approximately the same as they did under Louis XIV. Our final goal, and it would be extraordinary if we achieved it, would be that if tomorrow morning King Louis XIV came back here and saw these flower beds, he would appreciate our flowers as he did those of his gardener Le Nôtre. A place of entertainment for the court of King Louis XIV and later capital of the kingdom and scene of absolute power, Versailles is a symbol of French culture of the 17th century. And while he was talented, André Le Nôtre was no less a famous courtesan who succeeded in acquiring the favors of the king. Through a probably well-practiced affability that in his lifetime earned him the name Bonhomme Le Nôtre, he was able to keep the gossip and scandals of the court at a distance and attract the good graces of a king who had a passion for gardens. During his career, the gardener would design and complete numerous projects in France and abroad, notably one for Charles II of England. In 1684, Le Nôtre transformed the gardens of the Château de Chantilly for Le Grand Condé, the favorite cousin of the King of France. Its park occupies only 115 hectares of a domain that counts 8,000 and would be strongly marked by the two axes along which André Le Nôtre structured his layout. Chantilly is the only site created by the gardener Versailles where the axis does not pass the palace but its esplanade. Le Nôtre traced a long gravel walk going from the Grille d'Honneur, the gate, and continuing to the other side of the Grand Canal into the forest. The Chantilly estate presents a vast recreational nature reserve, including forests, parks, woods, canals, and parterres, that fan out around the prestigious palace.
The chateau is here because it was constructed on a rock, on a strategic path between the city of Saint-Lys, the first capital of France, and Beauvais. It was a chateau owned by the families who could control all the traffic passing over this route. A medieval chateau as we imagine one to be, with fortifications and towers a bit like those of Sleeping Beauty's castle. Then, at the time of Louis XIV, the chateau had entirely lost its military function because France was a land completely at peace. France sent its armies to foreign lands, but there was no combat on its own soil. As they no longer needed a castle fortress, the chateau became the places of reception and pomp, the places where princes had fun. There are some other amusing particularities of Chantilly, and one is this large route. Normally, Le Nôtre always had his parterres start from a Baroque chateau. Here it's not the case. Here we are on this large path which goes north-south. The chateau is off to the side. At the time, the chateau was not at all as it is today. This is in fact the third or fifth version of the chateau if we count the little strongholds that had been here before. At the time of Le Nôtre, there was still a medieval chateau, the Sleeping Beauty one, with the turrets. Le Nôtre, who adored symmetry, could not bear to start his flower beds with a centuries-old chateau, one that he did not like at all, as a focal point. And so he put it off to the side and created the main path in the center with a branch. Behind here, there's an aisle that has unfortunately become a bit closed off over time. On the one side, there's the main gate, which is in a depression which closes the site. The eye can look beyond it. And on the other side, there's an aisle which continues for kilometers, which was created by Le Nôtre. Crossing these paths, we could meet Condé, surrounded by his courtiers or friends, watering his carnations, his favorite flower. We get a glimpse of the absolutist vision of Louis XIV, transposed on nature. There are straight lines, right angles, all but something natural. The Pauter suffered during the revolution. When the Duke of Amal returned, he tried to restore the Pauter. The French-style Pauter at Chantilly offers the most dazzling point of view of the garden. It includes vast mirrors of water that reflect the sky, numerous fountains and jets of water, and a collection of statues of high quality. Of all the gardens of Le Nôtre, Chantilly was his favorite. The parterre of Le Nôtre also dates from this period. He transformed this swap here into a parterre. At the time, the lord of the chateau was a great constable, a cousin of Louis XIV. There was a little rivalry between the two of them to see who could have the biggest, the most beautiful and the most magnificent parterre. Of course Versailles won because Louis XIV had more means than the prince of the chateau of Chantilly. However, there are some special aspects of the parterre of Le Nôtre to which much pride could be attached. The first is the fountains known at the time as the miracles of water. In the 17th century, they were extremely impressive because these were the only fountains in the world that could flow 24 hours a day. In order to achieve this, Le Nôtre redirected a river to continuously feed the fountains. At Versailles, for example, and everywhere else, you had quite impressive hydraulic machines that brought the water up into a large tank that could be found at the highest point of the city. When Louis XIV strolled through his gardens, the gardeners opened the gates to make the fountains work, just as the king reached this or that grove. As soon as the king left, the gardeners would close the gates. They ran behind the king because if they opened all the gates at the same time, there would be no water left within a quarter of an hour. If that happened, they would then have to wait two or three weeks for the basins to be filled. Only at Chantilly did the water flow constantly.
Out of all of André de la Notre's gardens, the ones at Chantilly are the ones that include the greatest expanse of water, with the total surface area of 25 hectares. Here, we're at the center of the parterre, with three major characters from the chateau, represented by statues. At the middle of this place of honor is the Grand Condé. During his reign, this was the place where he often welcomed figures who had little respect for the ruling power, such as Molière, who came to perform and write plays at Chantilly, plays that were not always appreciated by Louis XIV. The third statue is that of André de la Nôtre, who created the parterres. When his statue was restored a few years ago, it was almost black and terribly worn. The restoration revealed that on the document he is holding in his hand, there's a map of the parterre. On the map, we can see that next to the parterre, there's another part of the French-style garden that was behind us, but that disappeared after the revolution. Since then, the garden has been transformed into an English-style garden. Le Notre wanted a spade to appear on his coat of arms, which almost passes as a little humor, because the chalk line, the pencil, the set square and optical measuring instruments would have been more appropriate in his armory. Because Le Notre probably never turned over a flower bed, but indeed entire landscapes. This is incidentally what is very well illustrated in the gardens of the Chateau Royal of Saint-Germain-en-Laye to the west of Paris. André Le Nôtre designed the gardens of Saint-Germain between 1663 and 1672, his project of perspective having prevailed over that of the architect Leveau. Here, Le Nôtre arranges palace, parterres, walkways, forest and valley in an irregular and complex composition. As the centuries pass, its greatness remains intact, notably in one of the gardener's major works, the Grand Terrasse. Wishing to leave his mark, Louis XIV asked Le Notre to create two great axes. The one behind us, three kilometers long, is in front of the old palace with its grand parterres. It was created by Le Notre at the request of Louis XIV in 1663. We are on the axis of the old palace. Originally, it didn't look at all like it does today, with these highly developed plants, hybrids that are very interesting horticulturally speaking. What we had here, essentially greenery, bushes, was without doubt Santolina and Hughes. Green on green, along with the lawn. There were motifs and designs that imitated arabesques. The designs also represent dance steps, because Louis XIV was one of the greatest dancers of his time. We were still working with representation. At the time, someone who saw these parterres could think of the step of a certain dance and thus a certain music. They have disappeared because these days their upkeep is very difficult. There are not enough personnel and it's neither sufficiently understood nor demanded by the public. Most people prefer something like what we have behind us, which is of a more 19th century style. Here we have something very pretty, very colorful, with dahlias and certain varieties of morning glory, all in sparkling colors. I always work with a color wheel, with a range of proposed colors. On the sides, to support all that, 
We have box trees, and in the center of the parterres, there are yew cones that respect the golden number. That is to say, one meter circumference at the base and two meters at the top. These cones are maintained two times a year. They are trimmed to size. Following the rules of the art, the trimming is always done by hand like they did at the Chateau de Versailles. In the center, we have what we call the bowling green, where one can play lawn bowling. It was there that the court would meet to play. These inclined pieces of lawn, or vetugadin, kept the ball in play. For these parterres, Le Nôtre played not only with the nuances of the greenery, but also the colors of the permanent materials, like the brick-red grog. There was white Carrara marble, coal or black dirt, and bluish slate. There were very nuanced permanent colors, in high contrast with the box trees in between, which followed the dance steps. Here are the grand parterres, the regular garden. I'm currently under a curtain of trees which are cut in the shape of a marquise. This was the spot where the horses and cavaliers could walk in the shade. It was looked down upon to get tan. So there were three curtains of trees or trellises, like the ones that can still be found in Compiègne. Now we have templates. The standard dimensions are 2.2 meters under the curtain, 4 meters for the curtain in total. It's worth noting that Le Notre was trained in the cabinet of Simon Vouet, one of the great painters of the time and a great painter of the court. It was like he did architecture with plants. He mastered vegetation as though it was architecture, forgetting that it was in fact plants. The Sun King wanted to domesticate nature, like he had mastered his surroundings and his entire entourage. At the time, there were ornamental lakes with waterworks, for which many calculations of perspectives were necessary. Imagine a gravel walk of three kilometers, with optical games that fool the eye of the visitor even today making them believe these three kilometers are shorter. This perspective invites you to engage yourself in it, to lose yourself, and to take in the entire Seine Valley, to see Paris and beyond. Here we find ourselves on the other axis of the Saint-Germain-les-Domaines, the one that faced the Chateau Neuf. It is Le Notre's most masterful achievement at Saint-Germain. The Grand Terrace measures 1,945 meters from the angle here to the end. The smaller terrace, the Belvedere, and the Grand Terrace together measure 2,500 meters. Le Notre completed the work in 1674. At the request of Louis XIV, there was debate between Le Vaux and Le Notre concerning the Chateau Neuf because it needed to have an axe that would master the landscape viewed from the Belvedere. You can see very far, the entire Seine Valley. You can really see very far, up to 180 degrees, both the countryside and the entire Parisian region. This foreshortened perspective is an optical illusion. It is more narrow at the beginning than at the end, which makes you willing to explore it, whereas if you knew that it was almost two kilometers long, you wouldn't want to walk the whole way. That's a play of altimetry and also planimetry. 
There are five breaks in the slope, but one doesn't really realize it. It gives the impression that it descends the entire way, while in fact it goes back up a little in the last quarter. In reality, the descent is only the first quarter, maybe the first third. After that, it does nothing but go up. The terrace is a hunting path. It was taken to get to the forest in order to hunt, and one could also admire the view of the Seine Valley along the way. The king could also stop at a hunting lodge, where he could find Madame de Montespan, to whom he gave the Château du Val. Thus, this allowed Louis XIV to go to see his mistress. The terrace was also inclined. You see the balustrade that was created in the 19th century. Under Le Nôtre and Louis XIV, there was a platform that was about 60 centimeters lower, more steep-sided than the balustrade. It's slightly inclined to make it possible to see the landscape in the distance. We are at the rising sun, where the Sun King appeared. Every night, the king would follow this magnificent route on his way to honor his conjugal duties. Here we arrive at an octagon, the royal circle, which was completely mineral. There was no lawn but gravel instead, and no balustrade. Only a trail that led to the Château du Val, where Louis XIV, in his youth, would go to find Mademoiselle de la Vallière, and later on, Madame de Montespan. This was in the hunting lodges that he owned in the forest of Saint-Germain. At the time of Le Nôtre and Louis XIV, the garden was never completely finished, but it served as the prototype for the groundbreaking creations at Versailles. All this thanks to Saint-Germain-en-Laye. We see that these gardens hold many stories, but also history itself. They are the theater of an invitation to knowledge, to imagination, and to pleasure. Later on, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, the prime minister of King Louis XIV, gave Le Nôtre the task of embellishing the Tuileries garden. which he would transform profoundly. He cleared several perspectives, one of which served to indicate the future most beautiful avenue in the world. The Avenue des Champs-Élysées in Paris. At his death in 1700, André Le Nôtre was very strongly linked to the golden age of France and its geopolitical radiance. He certainly remains the only gardener known and recognized the world over. <laughs>